We have a very special evening in store for you tonight. My name is Amanda Burden, and <laughs> and I think some of you know that um, uh, almost, well, it's more than 12 years ago, in, two th in the year 2000, uh, Robert Hammond and Joshua David took me up to see a rusty old structure that I had walked by for decades and I couldn't imagine why I was told I should go and climb up on this thing. And of course, when I did, it changed my entire life. And I said to both Robert and Josh that um, I wish I could help them save this structure from demolition, but I had no power at all. <laughs> and then an incredible thing happened. The stars aligned, and the mayor appointed me to be his planning commissioner, and the rest is history. It, so, but, woo. But really, as you know, we're here tonight to hear one of the most extraordinary individuals that I've ever met in my life. Uh, and I think, as you know, uh, Robert is shrewd. He is brilliant. He believes in community. He is able to be both a visionary and a pragmatist. And he has a gigantic heart. I think that uh, the High Line is embedded in his heart as Robert is embedded in our hearts. Uh, he has made an indelible contribution to the city of New York, and it will be with us forever, and will be in his debt forever. Uh, tonight, we get a chance to really hear Robert talk himself on stage, and often he doesn't do that, and he's going to be in discussion tonight with another extraordinary individual who I have also known for a very long time. Uh, his name is Darren Walker, and Darren is... Darren is now president of the Ford Foundation, and we are fortunate enough to have him as a board member uh, for the High Line, the Friends of the High Line. And you're going to hear a very fascinating conversation. And then part of this evening is also a bittersweet evening because Robert is going to be moving on to other things. But we want to uh, engage him tonight and hear his thoughts about the past, the present, and the future. And so let me take this opportunity to ask you to give an applause and welcome Robert Hammond and Darren Walker. <laughs> so, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> this is, after all, an auspicious occasion. So thank you, Robert Hammond. <laughs> this is such a treat for me. It's also as I think about your trajectory, it's also a moment for me to marvel at it. You and I both share a history of being Texans. Fortunately, <laughs> former Texans. <laughs> but I'm curious to know, how did your Texas upbringing, you were a nice boy from San Antonio <laughs> who ended up in the seventh grade at spring break in the Soviet Union. <laughs> There's got to be a story in the life of a boy from Texas who has that kind of experience. Yeah. Um, well, I think I had a very atypical Texas upbringing. And 
I, I want my my mother is here tonight. How many people know I've met my mother? Pat, <laughs> come on. Where's Pat? Stand up, Pat. <laughs> Pat Hammond, give it up for Pat Hammond. <laughs> so, you know, she, um, her and my, my dad gave me a very interesting uh, childhood. And um, she, you know, I mean, I, from the early, I was always embarrassed about how different my childhood was <laughs> when I was a kid. And now I realize how amazing it is. One time I asked her about, uh, paper or something about paper and she goes you know let's spend the afternoon with paper so we went in the yard and she cut some bamboo things down put them in a blender then cut out part of the screen porch to make a may and then she, we like made paper in the blender <laughs> you know so that's what happens when you asked a question about paper in my childhood but, <laughs> um, but the other thing is they, you know, she, she really taught me to find beauty in sort of different things and to follow my own passions. And so when I was in seventh grade, I read Nicholas and Alexandra, the, the book, and I was just captivated and I became obsessed with Russia. So my parents let me go to the Soviet Union at the time. This was in 83, I think. And, um, you know, spend the break Spring, spring break there, and they let me go back, and I lived there for three months uh, in, in, in college. And, and you so, weren't called on the streets of Texas a <laughs> communist, a socialist, or something? I, I was called a, a communist. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think it was just this um, sort of upbringing to, to, to sort of follow things that I was interested in, even if other people sort of weren't, that wasn't what they were doing. So, so then you just go off to Princeton where you are a star, of course, and you leave Princeton to come to Gotham where you are roundly rejected. Tell us about that rejection. <laughs> what it felt like, how it happened, how you responded. Well, I mean, if, anybody, if any of y'all have been in my office, you'll notice a stack of letters. It's like this big. And I graduated from Princeton. I did pretty well. I thought, you know, I'll get, come to New York like all my friends and try to get a job in investment banking and consulting. And I couldn't get a job. I got rejected. I got this stack of rejection letters from about 40 companies. Um, and no one would hire me. And I would always, often I'd make it to the very final last round, you know, three or four interviews, and then get rejected. Why? And, I mean, well, now I think that they could see that maybe I could do the job, but that my heart, like, they could see something that I couldn't see in myself, that I really shouldn't be an investment banker <laughs> or a consultant. <laughs> but instead of uh, sort of taking that, I became more obsessed and saying I had to get the job, you know, especially if I was rejected. And so I finally got a job doing consulting in Ernst & Young, um, and then I quit after a year because I was bored. Um, but it, 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 you know, that early rejection, I always feel like was a great lesson, especially in starting the Highline, because, um, you know, it sort of you learn this sort of thick skin of uh, of that, you know, just to keep going after rejection after rejection. And is that what you meant? You have in the book, you say, no plan, no money, no relevant experience. <laughs> no. So what do you mean by that? <laughs> That's. And when I was thinking of doing this talk tonight, I was thinking of doing, I sort of have a standard PowerPoint, but I thought, you know, one, I got so nervous making the PowerPoint because I was trying to think of how to sum up my experience on the High Line, and it was just so difficult, and that's why I asked Darren to do this conversation instead of the PowerPoint. But I have a slide in the PowerPoint when we talk about Josh and I first starting the High Line, and it says, you know, no plan, no money, no relevant experience, which, you know, sums up our, our early... <laughs> our efforts, and that um, it always sort of gets a laugh, because I think, I don't know, people think I'm joking or something, but <laughs> I, I think, you know, that's really the key to our success in some ways, is that by having no, rele no relevant experience, you know, we had to turn to other people to get things done. Um, we had to look for expertise in all of these different areas, and I think it also, people in some ways want to help you more, you know, when you don't have the experience, when you haven't done it before. Um, do you think that is because you were like naive and clueless? Uh, is it, is it, 
I mean, the fact that you had no planning experience, no. that you really didn't know. No, and, no, and I think it's not, I, I don't think it's, well, I wouldn't recommend every, you know, that that's the key to success is never having a plan, never have any money or no experience. <laughs> but I think it's not an impediment <laughs> to it. And then I just think it, 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 what it did is, I, it's interesting seeing, we, we hear a lot of people come to us, you know, with their own projects. And sometimes you have, you know, very wealthy people come that want to get something done. And they're going to pay for it. They don't have to raise a dime. And you know, often those projects never happen. Um, they can hire the expertise. They hire someone to do a plan. They have the money. But it doesn't build a, a group behind them. And that's what you know, we had to do. We didn't have any money, so we had to get supporters to come along. And then the other thing, the no plan, the reason I think that's important, and it, it doesn't mean don't plan, but and I'm trying to, this is good for me to talk, because this is like what I'm going through right now. Sometimes, is, you know, you'll know I'm le leaving, and I don't have a concrete plan of what, I, I have sort of a broad non-plan plan, but I don't have like a clear career plan. And it, it, it takes me back to the high line, because when we first started, everyone wanted to know, what do you, so you want to save it, but what do you want to do? What is the design? You know, show us design, show us renderings, tell us exactly what's going to happen. And, and actually, we tried it once. We did a few renderings, and they just looked sort of crappy and not exciting. And we realized the best thing to do was just to let people, we, we, and luckily, Joel Sternfeld took those amazing photographs, and that's what we used. So it wasn't a concrete plan. It was let, letting sort of other people and, and, and sort of ourselves over time, the vision of what it was going to become evolve rather than, because I think, I don't know what Josh and I would, if we had had to come up with a plan you know, when we started it, I don't think it would have been very good. <laughs> it wouldn't have gotten a lot of people interested. And so, you know, in some ways, that's what I'm trying to, trying to remind myself for my own career now, is that if I picture what, exactly what I'm gonna do right now, it would be the wrong thing for me. It sort of has to get out there and let it come and see what attaches itself together. So, so that moment when you and Joshua David came together has become sort of emblazoned in our psyche, like, I don't know, it was like when I saw Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford in The Way We Were, <laughs> and like, that moment. Do you remember? Do you who, remember? Who is, who, <laughs> you remember when like, when Barbara was like, and then they like finally like kissed and you were like, oh my God. This, so <laughs> is, is this, was it like that? Josh, was it like that? Exactly like that. It was exactly like that. Is what it, tell us. You were in this big blue fluorescent room, community board, what happened? We were, it was in Penn South, two blocks away, right, Josh? Yeah. Um, and I, I love this story. I was saying the other day, like, sometimes, on it, sometimes I've told the Highline story a lot, and sometimes that story gets a little old for me, sometimes. Um, but the story of us meeting does not get old, because to me it is so good, it's so crazy, that, you know, we sat next to each other in that community room, in summer, August of 99, and exchanged business cards afterwards. And this whole thing, you know, sort of tumbled out af after that. So, um, you know, it wasn't that, the meeting was not that memorable. <laughs> I mean, the, the actual meeting of the community room, I remember thinking, wow, this is crazy that people are coming to, that I'm coming to this on a beautiful <laughs> August evening. <laughs> um, but, you know, just that that can happen. And, and to me, that's, you know, when I always think of the High Line as um, uh, hope it inspires other, other people to start these things, you know, it's, it's, it's not that they necessarily build these, you know, parks on elevated railroads, but that, um, you know, they take those kind of actions. And I think you have to take a lot of those kind of actions that don't happen, but that exchanging of the business card um, and then following up with the conversation and the conversation after that. And, you know, I feel like that's the most important thing that Josh and I did was those first few calls. Um, and then, you know, getting other people involved that helped us give us that momentum to keep going. But, you know, so, like, what, how did that happen? So, because the, I received this invitation and it was, you know, come to, it was like, come to like a house party or something. And it was, you know. Our, fir our first event? I think it was the first yeah. event. 
I mean, but the first thing was just calling people around, uh, you know, and I, I um, my best friend, uh, Mario Palumbo, um, you know, called, I called him, and he was just an, an immediately excited about the idea, you know, really enthusiastic. I called my other best friend, Gifford Miller, who was a city council person at the time, who actually had, like, power to actually help, and he said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> And ultimately, luckily, we got him up there, and when he came up on a tour, he fell in love with it. And so, you know, before we had our first event, it was just getting people involved. You know, Josh got some of his friends involved, started getting some of the art galleries involved. Um, you know, it was just calling people up. I mean, the other rejection thing that helped was um, before I started the Highline, I, I was involved in a, it was a catalog that w went in hotel rooms and offered overnight delivery. And my job was to call up general managers of hotel and ask them to put the catalog in the room. So it was a lot of like cold calling, and it was really depressing, um, you know. And so I set myself this goal of a rejection goal instead of a success goal, where I would have to get every day a certain number of rejections. So then it made me feel better that like I met my goal. I got ten rejections, <laughs> and you know that's what it was like in the hut. Is I would and I, I have this piece of paper from my notebook where I would just write down people that I think might know other, you know, and then most of them would say it was uninteresting, but every once in a while they'd give me somebody else, like Gifford's mother, um, you know, gave me someone. And, you know, it, people just would say, oh, these people might be interested. And in the early days, sort of that's what Josh and I were doing, is just trying to find anyone, um, you know, that would get involved and, and help us. Then you met Dion. <laughs> Tell us about meeting Dion. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the other things that was great that was going on at the same time was Florent um, and Joe Hamilton were trying to do, um, to do a landmark, the meat market, which now seems sort of like an obvious thing, but at the time, there'd never been a, a landmarking of a neighborhood that wasn't sort of this traditional, beautiful neighborhood. It was these sort of old industrial buildings with sort of building types that didn't fit like a normal landmark typology. And they were doing that at the same time we were the high, at the High Line. And Diane von Furstenberg was one of their big supporters. So um, uh, Florent suggested you know, that we meet with her. And, and now she says you know, that she never thought this thing was going to happen. <laughs> but she just loved that we were these two crazy neighborhood you know, dreamers. And you know, that's what got her excited, was just this, this crazy dream. You got her excited. <laughs> she got excited. And her, her son joined the board right afterwards. And, and then you know, now her husband, Barry Diller, moved into the neighborhood. She moved. It was, now she's on 14th Street. But then she was a, a few blocks to the south. Right, right. So some people are surprised to learn, or at least the rumor is, that you don't even like flowers. <laughs> is that true? Can that no. be true, Robert Hammond? Doesn't like flowers? No, I do like flowers, uh, sort of. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was telling uh, Amanda earlier that people always want to take me to their gardens because they think I'm going to love gardens. And I, I sort of like gardens, but I'm not like a huge garden fan. And if anybody, I had a terrace uh, with a garden for a long time. And if anybody had seen what my terrace looked like, they would have never supported the High Line ever <laughs> because it did not, you know, I just find something on the street, some, and not like what you would think a neat plant on the street, but like a dead plant and put it on my terrace. But um, I guess it's just my kind of, I like sort of different kinds of beauty. And that's what, you know, the same thing about the meat market, you know, back in the day was, you know, the, like the beauty of having sort of the slippery, you know, you realize you're sort of slipping on something and it's, it's old rendered meat fat. Um, you know, and the High Line, I mean, when I went up on the High Line, I, I loved the Queen's Anne Lace, but I loved all the trash that was thrown up there. For whatever reason, there was tons of cell phones up on the High Line. Like, people would, you know, like, I guess get angry and throw their cell phone up there, and so there was, you know, and there was old furniture that had somehow gotten up there. And so, you know, in some ways, that's what I fell in love with as much as the flowers. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, Josh and I responded to our design team so well, is they had a, a, a sort of non-traditional view of beauty and what the High Line could be. And I feel like they really captured that 
Um, but there is no meat fat and <laughs> no sense of discarded furniture. I mean, some would say the High Line is so curated and pristine. Yeah, and, and that's why some of the things that I love, my favorite things on the High Line are the things that we don't plan. I mean, we do a phenomenal job of all these kind of programs, but to me it's when people do different things on the High Line, like the, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of y'all remember the old Renegade Cabaret um, patties. And, you know, what happened was when we opened the High Line, um, the, the, the stair at 20th Street, the light was misdirected and went into this woman's bedroom. And she called our office and said, please, you know, change the light. It's in my bedroom. And, and we didn't do it. We didn't get to it. And so, like a good New Yorker, she got a friend who was a cabaret singer to stand and serenade people on her fire escape. And it became, you know, the renegade cabaret. And so, you know, it's, to me, that's, it's these kind of, like, mistakes. I mean, you want to create a, a beautiful place and a place that, but it's the, when, really, when people use it in different ways that are often unintended, just like the High Line, you know, was never meant to be a park. It was meant to be an elevated railroad to bring freight onto the west side of Manhattan. And then it was abandoned, and these, you know, wildflowers grew up there. So these sort of unintended ways that people use the High Line. And the other thing that's, it, I love, is people come up there in the oddest costumes all the time. Um, I mean, t a lot of y'all know Tim Reese, our, our director of visitor services, and he, every Monday, he brings into the staff meeting, like, some bizarre picture of what someone did on the High Line. And, you know, people just feel they like to wear bizarre clothes and then walk on the <laughs> High Line. And so that makes me feel better that it still attracts sort of that odd, uh, events. And, and talk about how you answer when people say, um, what is the High Line? I mean, is it a park? Is it a public art space? What, what is it? Yeah. I mean, we, we, um, we never use the word park for a long time. And it's not that I also don't like parks. But um, I think we always thought of it as something more than a park. I mean, the best way I think of it is as a cultural institution. I mean, it's a cross between a lot of things. It's a park, it's a, you know, the level of plantings is really a level of a botanical garden, not a regular park. I mean, it's one of the reasons it's so hard to maintain and takes so much work. Um, cultural institution in the way of, of, of the programming that we do to try to involve the, the neighborhood and the city and people that use it. Um, and then the design, you know, I think is of, is of a level of a, of a cultural institution. So to me, it's sort of a hybrid of all of those things. Well, I remember when you and I, when you first came to talk to me about joining the board and you said the thing that really concerned you was that, was that people were getting the wrong idea of the High Line, that it being this elite for people living in, in the, the, the gallerists and, and the penthouses in the fancy new glass buildings and that you were actually really concerned about the neighborhood. And so talk a little bit about why that existed and what the High Line needs to do to make sure it remains authentic to the yeah. neighborhood. Um, I, mean, I mean, one of the, when Josh and I um, started, honestly, I don't think, well, I'll speak for myself, I wasn't thinking about all the neighborhood. <laughs> You know, I was sort of thinking about where I lived, my friends, and one of the first people we hired who's here today, Juliet Page. Where's Juliet? Juliet. Juliet, hey, our first Juliet. development director. Um, <laughs> you know, she was sort of the one that first pointed out, at least to me, that the neighborhood is more than sort of the galleries and sort of where I lived in the West Village, that it, ha it was actually a really diverse neighborhood in terms of the economics of pe the people that live there. And, you know, our first offices were actually, uh, our second offices were in the Hudson Guild just down the street. Um, and, you know, that's when I think we realized that the High Line ran through this neighborhood that was not all just sort of gentrifying um, part of Manhattan. And we made some early efforts. Um, to give us a, a little bit of credit, you know, we did some education programs in the little school, in the, in the schools nearby, but they were pretty little efforts. They didn't, you know, it was when we had time and um, when we hired our first person that ran programming, Meredith Taylor, who's also here. Um, you know, we did uh, uh, programming in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, we did programming in the neighborhood, but Meredith was doing a whole bunch of different kind of programs. And honestly, I think it wasn't until after we opened the High Line and we started talking to people in the neighborhood, and a lot of people in the neighborhood, when asked them, did they, they felt like the, neighbor, the, the High Line was not for them, that they did not come up there, that the uses on the High Line were not for them. And you know, that's when we realized we had, um, I think, you know, sort of a, of a problem, because I think we've always, you know, we want the High Line to be for everyone, for the whole city. I mean, we want lots of visitors and tourists to come, that's great. But ultimately, the, the, success, the long-term success of the High Line, sort of the real soul, will, will be our locals using it. And we want all locals. And so that's why um, about three years ago, uh, we did a, a survey of the two uh, NYCHA housing projects, which is the um, two housing projects right here. We're in one, and there's one to the south. We surveyed. Um, uh, almost a thousand residents to live there to find out because the other thing we used to do is we used to do community programming what we thought people would want in programming but we never really asked the community what they wanted from the highlight what what we could do and that's we did the survey and now developed a whole um, series of programming around that one of the big things that we heard from people is they they need jobs um, especially for teens in the neighborhood so we've created um, a youth core, a teen arts council, that actually, and the, my favorite thing about it is, it's not just giving people jobs, it's they're creating programs for the High Line. So, I mean, we're, we're, they're actually being paid to create programs, you know, for, for the community itself. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things I feel like when you talk about the future of the High Line, you know, that's where I see a lot of our future going, um, is in programming and trying to, to bridge this gap that's, that's here in the neighborhood. So you and Joshua have received many awards. You uh, have been um, anointed the two kings of planning. You have received the Jane Jacobs Award. You have received the Vincent Scully Award. I'm sure pretty soon you will be getting the Légion d'honneur or something that is <laughs> even the Queen of England, I'm sure, will have you <laughs> soon to knight you. But I'm wondering, when you think about all of these awards, um, what has it meant for you to get all this recognition? Because it's, you're not necessarily a person who seeks the limelight, uh, but it's got to have been fun. Yeah, well, I think a lot of my success is false humility, <laughs> is, 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 is acting humble. <laughs> uh, this was meant to be an evening that revealed <laughs> the real Robert Hammond. Um, no, I mean, it, it is, it is, I mean, it has been really nice um, getting this recognition. Um, and in some ways, it's hard uh, to take in the High Line and take in you know, what we've done, and I, you know, to me, when I really feel it uh, the most is uh, I'll get some email from out, out of the blue or someone, actually someone here that just said hello, you know, will send uh, a letter spontaneously, you know, talking about what the High Line uh, meant for them, and that's to me, uh, you know, when it, when it, when it sinks in. The other thing that's sort of cool is, is, is being at a restaurant and then hearing someone at the table next to you talk, talk about the High Line. But what happens say, when they say, I hated the High Line today. <laughs> it was too crowded. It was too hot. The, the food was too expensive. Yeah, no, those are the emails I get from my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's part of the reality. I mean, you know, that's, it's interesting. I mean, it's a great problem to have, which is this over-success problem. And I think, again, that's the biggest issue that we have to address, is that the High Line doesn't become, you know, just for tourists. And, you know, I think most locals now know, you all know, you know, you don't come on Saturday and Sunday, on Saturday and Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You come in the morning, you come at night. But I think that's also, there's, that's also something we have to do. And again, that's to me where the programs come in. And that's why we gear, um, you know, the 450 free programs we did this year you know, to locals. I mean, we could do tours, Highline tours for tourists all day. Um, you know, but doing things for kids, for families in the neighborhood. Um, and so, and you know, not everyone has to love the Highline all the time. <laughs> so you, um, 
you obviously, uh, Robert, are a very passionate person. Let's talk about your personal life. <laughs> Has the High Line been tough on your personal life? They showed me some of these questions, and I swear I crossed out <laughs> <laughs> the question about my personal life. I, I mean, I, where's AV? <laughs> I know I crossed that out. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, well, how many ex-boyfriends are in the audience? <laughs> None. I guess that, I don't know what that, that maybe that says it all. Um, <laughs> Yes, as I often say, you know, Josh is my longest relationship. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know. I mean, the thing that's been great about my personal life on the High Line is that I have, I, when I think back of, uh, of, of my good friends and some of my best friends, a lot of them I met on the High Line. <laughs> you know, I think that our friendship was before the High Line or I met them some other way, but so many of my friends are people... You know, I met working on this project, and uh, you know that's, you know, maybe, yeah. So that's that's a pretty good benefit of <laughs> <on the> personal <laughs> life. <laughs> and so, one way in which you guys could get people excited about the High Line, as you say, was to bring people up. So you referenced another one of those moments that, again, is emblazoned in the memory and the lore of New York, and that is bringing Amanda Burden onto the High Line for the first time. Was she wearing her great heels on no, that occasion? Am what was she doing? Am Amanda plays, I, I didn't know Amanda, and a, 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 one of our key supporters, Phil Ahrens, uh, said, oh, you should take Amanda up, and he introduced us by email, and we made it, um, arrangements to go up, and at that time, we used to go up through Chelsea Market, a freight elevator there. And, um, the day we arranged, it was a really uh, snowy uh, day, and it was just pouring snow, it was freezing, and I thought, oh, she's never going to show up, and, and she didn't show up. And so I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, you know. And then I, I got a call from her later, and I'd given her the wrong address, so she had stood on a <laughs> freezing, snowy street corner waiting for me for quite a while. <laughs> And so then I thought, oh, well, then she's never going to show up for the next tour after I did that. <laughs> but she came up. And actually, I don't remember the tour um, at all. <laughs> but I remember afterwards, uh, we sat down uh, in Chelsea Market at one of these round tables. And I, I brought a map. And I showed you know, the map of the High Line. And she, just, she sort of mapped out our future then. And like she said, she really didn't have the ability to make that happen. But what was amazing is she you know, saw that you know, for us. And then I guess it was a, several years later, you know, I actually helped make that happen. But that rezoning and the transfer of development rights that you know, at the time we were locked in this l protracted legal battle, you know, fighting the property owners. You know, one property owner, I think, spent over $3 million fighting us in legal fees. and. Um, so you know, she was the one that figured out how to unlock um, that piece of planning. So there are many people, and including uh, a former mayor, who um, had a goal of uh, tearing down the High Line. And I have witnessed on occasion some of those people who had it uh, in their head to uh, tear down the High Line, uh, who have approached you and just high-fived you and <laughs> told you how great an idea it was and took credit with you for the success of it. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, to give them credit, most of them acknowledge what their, <laughs> their, their feelings were about the High Line. And, you know, I mean, it's also now it's so hard for people to understand why people were against it because it's successful, it's, it's great. But you know, to their defense, it was pretty unlike. I mean, even myself, I, I thought the chances of this happening, you know, were one in a hundred. So I think, you know, one that that property owners that owned it couldn't build a, you know, they'd have to build around it. And even you know, community members. I mean, savvy community members that really liked the High Line, but they felt like we were just postponing the inevitable. That eventually it was going to turn down, but we're just sort of freezing the neighborhood and, and preventing it to move on. So I, I do have um, um, 
some sympathy for, for their feelings. I'm always sort of curious you know, to ask Giuliani what he thought. I mean, the reality was he probably never even heard of the High Line. <laughs> Someone else made that decision, but always sort of curious, has he been up there? We, 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 we notice when people go up there, we've never heard of a sighting of Giuliani, but. But you had a sighting of Michelle Obama. Yes. <laughs> Talk about the sighting of Michelle Obama. <laughs> and her two daughters. They came up early uh, one morning. We, we had no idea, but she came up and uh, came down. That was very exciting for us. So section three, tell us about section three. Well, you know, most of y'all know we're opening the, the from uh, where section two ends to 34th Street next year. And then I hope a lot of you have seen the new designs for the last part. So, and I know a lot of you probably have old Save the Spur t-shirts in your closet, those red t-shirts, because I know a lot of you came out when that was threatened. It's still, I never really even can tell the story that people wanted to tear down that last part of the High Line just, you know, two, three, four years ago. No one really believes that, but I, I think some of y'all, you know, helped us fight that last battle. But that was the last part to design, and we just showed those designs um, at a community meeting um, last month. And it, it was one of the most challenging pieces of the design um, because the design team had been coming up actually with concepts for it for four years, four, maybe even five years. And just we couldn't quite get it right. And as some of you know, for a while we had the Jeff Koons train hanging you know, over the spur that I'm, so, I'm sure some of you loved, some of you hated. Um, I, I loved it. But, uh, <laughs> but didn't work, you know, just too expensive, too crazy even for us. Um, but, you know, the design team, and so finally, um, one day the design team came to us um, uh, with this concept of this, of this bowl. And we knew we wanted plant, we knew planting that, you know, with Hudson Yards around it, you're going to have such high development that you couldn't really compete with it with a building. And so we knew somehow green had to be a part of it. But how do you pack, the, the, the spur, we talk about it like it was always really big. It's, the spur is the same size as the 10th Avenue Square, so it's not that big. So you can't get that much planting in it. So what the design team, they, they saw this picture of a valley. And so they wanted to think, how could you build the experience of a valley? So you, you, know, you can pack more green by sort of going up the sides, but how do you put a valley on something you know, that's smaller than this room? So they, 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 they came to us with this drawing of, like a, of a bowl that sort of lifted up. And you don't have access to the bowl. So it's just, that's where you put the green. And you sort of slip under uh, the bowl to get in there. And then you're surrounded by the green. And it's not even that big. I mean, it won't even be this tall. You know, it's, it's about 20 feet of green. But so it sort of, sort of takes the high line up, and you're surrounded by it. And you'll see, it's, it's and the, the magic to me of the Highline is never a total escape from the city. So even in that bowl, you'll lift it up. You'll see the street. You'll be able to see, you're not going to escape Hudson Yards. You know, you're going to see the tall buildings sort of rimming it. But it's going to give this, this kind of enclosure um, that hasn't happened anywhere on the Highline. So like the team has always done it, I feel like they just nailed it. And, um, and th those designs are on the website if you, if you haven't seen them. And so talk about Liz and Charles and I mean, the whole team. That's been an experience. Yeah. I mean, you know, I feel like that's uh, another gift that, you know, Josh and I get all this great credit for the High Line where we really didn't do it. You know, the design team came up with this amazing concept. And, um, you know, it, it's, you know, led by James Corner uh, Field Operations with, with uh, Dillard Cofino Renfro and Pete Uldoff. And, you know, they just got the magic of the High Line from the beginning. There was um, a quote that I always loved from uh, the book The Leopard, and it was, for things, to, for things to stay the same, everything has to change. And I think they, 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 they got that when they were designing the High Line, is that they needed to capture some of the beauty, but not just freeze it. Because it, I don't think it would have worked if you had, you know, we weren't able to just keep it exactly as is. We had to do this, you know, all the remediation. But somehow capture that spirit and translate it in a different, different way. And again, to me, it's that keeping, um, it's not an escape from the city, but it's part of the city. And, um, and the way, you know, Amanda always talks about the planting. And I think it's the planting that helps you experience the city in a different way. And I think it makes you act in a different way. Um, you know, I often tell the story that, 
to me, the, the, where I, when I first saw the impact of the High Line was when I noticed people holding hands on the High Line, that you, know, you don't see that in New York very often, but you see it on the High Line. And I think it's, this, it's you know, slowing you down from this pace that you're normally in. And it's somehow the combination of the, the, the design, but then the plantings work some kind of magic, I think, on your brain, even if you don't like flowers. So speaking of holding hands and other things, I received from you and Josh a program announcement that, of course, sent me back. And it, the headline was, The High Line's Gay History. And there was this vibrant photograph of a naked man, a naked 25-year-old man, with, he was holding something <laughs> no, in that, front of. No, we put the eye in front. Oh, you put the eye in front. Eye line went in front. <laughs> in front, but it was very provocative. <laughs> and it was, come along for a gay history, no, it, it was, and, and the it high was, line is gay, please help us <laughs> it was behind, understand what the purpose of that was. <laughs> it was behind the bushes, the secret homo history of the high line. <laughs> was that your title? Josh, did you come up with the title? I don't know. It might have been Danya that came up with that title. Um, but it was, it was a talk we gave at the, the Gay and Lesbian Center. And, you know, I think we'd always sort of thought about a little bit about the role gay. You know, we sort of are a, a friend of mine. It might have been Evan. Who's your name. One of my friends from college came to one of our very first uh, events that we threw. And he said, wow, there's a lot of men here. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of our friends were gay, and a lot of our early supporters were gay supporters. But then starting looking at sort of the history of the neighborhoods and this interesting case of how, you know, sort of the gay neighborhoods have in some ways followed, I mean, we followed them in terms of uh, the West Village, Chelsea, um, Hell's Kitchen and the role of like gay clubs in the neighborhood. That's where a lot of people first sort of discovered, um, you know, the High Line was on the way to Twilo and Roxy. Um, and then but, then, but then sort of the role that gays have played in preservation uh, movement, you know, throughout his, and there's a great Herbert Mushamp quote that, that Josh had always loved that, and I'll butcher it a little bit, but something that the story, the, the unspoken story of preservation in New York is the, alliance between gay men and, I don't know, rich, straight, white women or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, because I, I, mean, I think it's interesting looking at, you know, do, and, you know, the, the sort of Richard Florida argument of, of gays going into neighborhoods um, and sort of seeing sort of the hidden gem or neighborhoods that other people think are ugly and run down or, you know, and sort of, sort of looking at that. One of the things I've always loved, there's a guy, Harry Hay, who, uh, started the Mattachine Society and the Radical Fairies. And he had a quote that said, uh, the only thing that gay people and straight people have in common is what they do in bed. And his point was that gay people, that the gay movement often tries to say gay people and straight people are, are we're all the same. And his point was that gay people are actually different and see things differently. And so that, the, I mean, the talk was partly excused to do that poster. <laughs> <laughs> To, to be well, able to put you the got a lot of people's and attention, I, including I, your board. And, and if you want to buy the poster, Nicole in the back can sell you. We, we now sell um, that oh poster. Oh my gosh, you're selling that thing? <laughs> and even worse, Darren, it, oh. the, the guy who took the photograph is coming out with a photo of all of the photos without the eyes. In front. <laughs> and so. uh, crediting you? I mean, <laughs> no, how? well, we didn't have anything to do it. He... He he uh, he he took people. He trespassed and took people up on the High Line um, to take naked pictures. Yeah. Wow. So we were not involved. He came to us afterwards with these photos. <laughs> okay. Let us move on. <laughs> One thing that happens is that people come to you and Josh from all over the world and say, "We want a High Line," and talk about what that is like, and of course, most recently, I know there was some Sheka or something who flew you over to one of the Emirates so that you could help them design 
out of nothing a High Line. I mean, really? <laughs> really? Well, I mean, what I think, you know, when I took, when I always, I mean, I mean, one of my goals is that the High Line has always inspired people, but it's, you know, it's not for them to build High Lines elsewhere. And I think, to me, the most uninteresting projects are when people come and they say, we want, you know, a High Line in our neighborhood or in our city. And, you know, to me, that's, and that those people, those projects never go anywhere, interestingly, you know, when they want to just replicate exactly the High Line. To me, the projects that are interesting are the ones that often are started by people in their own community, um, and they want to do something that reflects the own, their sort of the own history of their neighborhood or their own structure. Um, you know, and it's happening all over in Philadelphia, Jersey City, um, Chicago. You know, and, the, the, and to me, really to me, the ones that are the low line, you know, the ones that, that, that work are the ones that come up with something that's unique to their structure, to, to what they're trying to do, rather than, you know, putting in, um, you know, uh, planks like ours or, th or things like that. So, and, and to me, the bigger, the, the more interesting things are when people are just looking at old industrial spaces and re-envisioning uses. You know, it doesn't have to be elevated parks. Um, and so, one of the, you did say that the next phase of the Robert Hammond journey was, is not yet charted, but you are going to be a filmmaker. We, we are going to see Robert Hammond walking the red carpet, I am sure, in Hollywood in a year to come. And why don't you tell us how you're going to get there, Robert? I don't know about, yeah, but I'm, I'm a, become, I've become a big Hollywood producer. That's what, I, that's what I should start telling people when they say, what are you doing? Be a big Hollywood producer, a big, I'm doing a blockbuster movie about uh, Jane Jacobs. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, um, it will be a blockbuster. <laughs> it's a very exciting subject. No, it is an exciting subject. And what I met, um, I guess almost four years ago, I met a guy named Matt Ternauer, who uh, is a writer who did a documentary on Valentino called The Last Emperor. And when I met him, he was obsessed with Jane Jacobs. And I loved that you know, this guy that did a documentary on Valentino was obsessed with, with, with Jane Jacobs. And we started talking and realized that no one had done a documentary on her. You know, she's been in the New York documentary, but there had never been anything on her. And then we, when we really started talking, we, we also wanted to do something that would make it relevant to now. Because to me, what's so powerful about the story about Jane is, and I, I believe that she wouldn't want all of the things that she prescribed you know, for her neighborhood and for her cities and cities at the time to, to be prescribed now. All, in all cases, I think she, what she did is she looked around her own neighborhood, her own city, her own country, and came up with solutions to problems that she saw. And you know, that's what I feel like we need now. So what we decided to do was to look at urbanization around the world and, and really where these things are happening, you know, China, India, Africa, where there's this massive urbanization and that you know, is either going to exacerbate all the problems that we have in the world, um, you know, food shortage, income inequality, sustain energy sustainability, environment, or it can help solve those problems. So sort of looking at those issues through her lens um, to, to see, and I, I, you know, it's not that we're gonna say we have the answer to urbanization, but it's sort of to shine the light that we have a real crisis here and sort of look at it through, through Jane's eyes. So we have time for a few questions for our honored guest. And so we have a traveling mic here. Questions from the audience. And I can tell you are not a lot of wallflowers. So please raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Yes, sir, over here. Thank you. Please wait for the mic. And state your name and please ask a question. Hi, my name is, is this working? My name's Tom Tapusis. Hi, Robert, how are you? Um, you've mentioned other projects like the High Line. People in Queens are trying to redevelop an old rail line. Have you talked to them, or what sort of advice would you give them? What do you see the, the possible outcomes there? Yeah, so um, Tom is talking about uh, the Queen, Queens Way in Queens, which is an old um, a rail line that they're trying to turn into a park. And actually, one of the founders is a guy, Travis Terry, 
um, who was really helpful to us in, in our early stages. So we have been talking um, you know, to them. And um, you know, I'm a fan. There's some people that want to return uh, it to light rail there. And that was something that came up for us as well. You know, one of the things we studied early on was whether the Highline could be used for, 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 for light rail. I mean, one of the hard parts um, about, one of the advantages we had is there was not a lot of people living in the neighborhood. And one of the biggest you would, problems that um, happens when you have some of these projects is sometimes people don't want their neighborhood connected to other neighborhoods. I mean, in Chicago, it's a real issue. It runs through some very well-off neighborhoods and some less well-off neighborhoods. And people don't want those, the people in the well-off neighborhood do not want access, access in their neighborhood. They don't want the connections. So, you know, it brings up a lot of, uh, you know, interesting issues when you have exist, you know, people already um, living there. Yes, sir, here, and then we've got a question there. A question for Robert Hammond. Hi, Robert. Um, my name is Pete Davies. Uh, I was hoping you could speak, Amanda mentioned that you're a pragmatist, and so of some of the pragmatic choices that you and Josh had to go through in terms of negotiating some of the development that's yeah. going on around the High Line, um, I'd be curious to hear about that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the high, um, Josh and I did a talk sort of on this topic a little bit um, down in Washington a few weeks ago where we're looking at that when, when we meet with a lot of people that are starting these projects, I talked about sort of the rich people with their own projects, but you can divide the, the groups up into two categories often. And on one hand often is either a project from the community, a design-oriented project, um, and on, or, or with a really amazing vision. And on the other hand, sometimes project often from the government or from real estate interests. And you know what to, to, to have and, and the, the people you have there has to come together. Um, and what, what the issue is is you know people think well then it's all about compromise or you know sort of dumbing it down to get to get it together. And I think what's um, where something interesting comes out of that is where sort of that that friction rubs together and something more interesting comes out of it. But you know, for the, the development issue on that case, um, you know, we had a lot of issues on this rezoning that we were talking about um, that was in the neighborhood. Um, some people wanted you know, lo as low density as possible. Some people's main goal was affordable housing. And then we had the High Line. And I mean, we, we all, sort of want, you know, work together, but our goals didn't always meet up. Um, and so that was the compromise of the rezoning, you know, um, almost 30% of the, of the new housing that was planned was, will be affordable. Um, they kept the, the density, will low, uh, uh, that, that was the goal of the, <laughs> the zoning. Um, I think one of the reasons, uh, Pete's laughing, is uh, one of the issues is that um, the, the, the mix of, uh, condo versus rental is different than what people thought would actually get built out. So I, I don't know if it'll hit that goal. Um, but, uh, but, and then, then the density issue, I mean, not everyone won everything there. I mean, they kept the density lower in the historic district, but higher density to the north and the south, where there were going to be buildings bigger. And we didn't get everything. You know, we didn't get a funding mechanism for the High Line. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that is a big regret for, for us is that we don't have, we don't benefit, um, the High Line doesn't benefit from the value it, it, it creates. Um, you know, there's no funding mechanism that comes back because some of that funding, you know, went to affordable housing. Some of it, there was, a, there was less because of the lower density. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it gives or take. But to me, one of the things that's, that's interesting is it creates um, a different kind of zoning rather than just a cookie cutter rezoning that was all, uh, you know, rezoned standard manufacturing. And then the other piece is they kept, you know, keeping the mid blocks manufacturing, which, you know, helped keep a lot of the art galleries there rather than zoning. I mean, most people don't realize it, but t 10th and 11th Avenue is, was rezoned for residential, but the mid blocks, and this is something Amanda felt really strongly, a lot of the mid blocks were kept manufacturing. Um, so, you know, those buildings 
you know, aren't going to be torn down and, and have less value, hence it's easier for the galleries to stay. Yes, sir. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Daniel Isengard. Um, Robert, you're obviously a visionary and you are a great success story and I think you already made clear that part of your success is due to your ability to compromise and to delegate to people who may have more expertise in fields that you don't know about. But um, could you say something about um, uh, something that you have learned from this whole process that was very unexpected to you? Great question. Um, well, I mean, I've definitely learned a lot. Um, I mean, I think the, har the thing that's, been, that's come up for me the har uh, lately uh, is how hard, I, I always knew I would leave the High Line. I sort of knew I wasn't going to be a lifer here. Um, I just, I don't know, and, and you know, from the beginning, I just had sort of always been interested in sort of founder syndrome and you know, didn't want to stay too long. And also for me personally, you know, at some point wanted another career. And so I, I thought about leaving after we opened uh, section one um, and, uh, and have someone else open maybe section two, you know, but I'm very thankful I, I stayed. And uh, so, you know, when I announced that I was leaving, it wasn't a, wasn't, it wasn't a shock to me, you know, it was sort of something I knew was going to happen. But what has been um, just so hard is how hard it is for me to leave. Like, it has just been killing me. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, and it's the, uh, the peop you know, the people, you know, I, I said this the other night, um, that it's, you know, it's not the high line that I'm going to miss at all, really. Um, you know, maybe it's because I don't like the flowers, but um, <laughs> um, and it's not that I don't love the high line, obviously. But it's, it's the people that is so hard to leave, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of y'all here tonight, uh, the, uh, you know, volunteers, but, you know, I have to say the hardest thing is the staff. Um, I mean, I love my board. I love y'all, you know, our volunteers, our donors, the people that show up for things. But the main thing is uh, the staff. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Yay! A round of applause yeah. for Robert Hammond. Yeah. 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 Got it. Yay, yeah. Robert! Yeah. Yay, So, I told you it was one going more, to be... One more, one more. You know, I also want to okay. thank... Um, That's for me. He's not just uh, staff, but Joshua <laughs> has been a partner. Yeah, <laughs> Joshua! Take a bow, Joshua! Uh, like, even people that know me pretty well, or maybe people that know me really well don't think this, but a lot of people think that I must be really great to work with. <laughs> but I won't ask the staff members that have cried in meetings to raise their hands <laughs> tonight. Because um, I'm not always easy to work with. Um, and, you know, Josh is born of a lot of that brunt and just been just this incredible partnership. And I... I, I um, you know, often now when I think of what I want to do next, I, I, it's hard for me to think about doing something new um, without a partner. You know, I just think about, oh, the way I think about it is, oh, I'll meet someone and it'll be a really passionate project, you know, because that's how we got, you know, this done. And so it's sort of, if you, you know, ask what I've learned or what I see in my future, you know, is, is not necessarily repeating it exactly, but, you know, it's just that partnership that I don't, we, we could not have done this, you know, on our, on our own. So, thank you. So, I would like to thank P.S. 
33. We are so grateful to be in your building, your facility. Thank you, PS33. <laughs> and thank you to Robert Hammond for your amazing resilience, your creativity, the life you lead, and the future that you are going to have after the High Line. You will always be a part of the High Line and in our hearts. And we wish you well, because we know that you are going to do great things in the future. A big round of applause for Robert Hammond. Yeah.